Okay, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode number 149 with my guest, Michael Rosen. Um, he was on the podcast a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> um, but I had him on with uh, one of the guys from So, Adam Slowinski. Adam studied with uh, Mr. Rosen at Oberlin Conservatory, at the Oberlin uh, Conservatory of Music in Ohio uh, for his undergrad, and then we met at Yale University later. I wanted to speak with uh, Mr. Rosen and Adam about sort of the history of contemporary percussion music and its lineage through orchestral percussion, uh, as well as the development of um, contemporary mar- uh, marimba repertoire for our field, and uh, also just about pedagogy. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. This is Michael Rosen and Adam Slowinski. Take care. Bye. I had a wonderful time chatting with you, Mike, last week um, about sort of your path in music, um, and in particular, the development of, or the sort of growth of the orchestral percussion section as an entity, as a, and also an educational force um, and then also the development of contemporary percussion through your work at Oberlin, uh, your time at the University of Illinois with Tom Saiwi, and, and in particular with you, the development of marimba repertoire, um, you premiering Taurus III in uh, 1973. Um, so those are sort of just some, some uh, highlights for me in terms of our conversation if we're talking specifically about percussion pedagogy. But I wanted Adam here to talk with us because Adam – was in the room with you for better or worse uh, on your behalf, Mike, um, for four or five years. And he knows the department there more intimately. And I, I kind of want to have him here to ask more specific questions and to facilitate a chat. So that said, I kind of want um, you, Mike, to help guide us a little bit through like the nickel and dime tour of what's, what's the Disneyland tour if I'm in the teacup riding around of the history of percussion music uh, from your vantage point. Um, at Oberlin or in the world? Um, well, let's let's start with, um, in particular, maybe the University of Illinois. That was a sort of that was a sort of like hub, I think, in particular for you uh, and for other folks in my world, like Larry Snyder um, and Mike Udow and some other folks. So maybe let's start there, and then we'll see where we go. Well, um, obviously, when I was um, studying with Charlie Owen, there was no no sense of contemporary music at all. I mean. Let's think about what pieces were being written in the world, uh, not only percussion, um, uh, in the 1960s when I was in college. Uh, when was Zyklus? 50s, right? 59, 60. Is that right? Yep. There was also a piece right before that that hardly anybody plays. It was written in 1957 for solo percussion uh, by Riedel. A, com- a composer by the name of Riedel, uh, German, obviously, Anton Riedel, who wrote a piece that was a variations on a Beethoven piano sonata. I don't think it's ever been played. I have the music to it. It's really kind of bizarre, mainly because of the, in- of the um, uh, notation. Uh, they had no idea right to- how to make the notation. So it's one of those things with uh, 10 or 15 lines you jump here, jump there, jump here, jump there, you know, and it's uh, very hard to read. Um, I've never had anybody do it. What's the instrumentation? Uh, solo percussion. Wow. That's why, for me, that's the first piece that was written for solo percussion uh, before uh, Zuclus. Uh, that just seems that. But, of course, Zuclus was the one that really uh, got off with uh, Christoph Kosko and... Um, I remember uh, the uh, who was the um, the, uh, the percussionist who died fairly recently, who did uh, lots of um, later on did lots of installations at Times Square, and uh, he has a, a recording. It's not Max Neuhaus, is it? Max Neuhaus. Okay. Uh, on the cover with a no shirt on and long hair. I mean. I think that was probably in the late sixties. That was crazy. Yeah. I mean, it was this guy was nuts. Um, so <clears throat> that was sort of the beginning of that. Um, I remember going to uh, Germany and talking with uh, Christoph Koskel, who was kind of a strange guy. He, because um, uh, I went over there in nineteen seventy uh, six or so when I started. Um, <clears throat> researching my terms used in percussion. And I went over and talked to uh, him. I talked to Francois Dupin. I talked to Delacluse. 
I talked to um, some um, other German guys, but I remember Koskel being kind of a, a clean nick. Like wherever we went to a different place, he would wash his hands, and he was very hyper and up. But um, like I say, what other pieces were there? You tell me in 1960, 61. Well, I mean, when was uh, when was Morris Dance written, like William Craft? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think the seventies, okay. but of course those weren't those weren't considered contemporary music, right? Considered a a little a cute little thing. Mm. I think there were a number of pieces kind of coming out of the percussion world and the sort of percussion ensemble scene, mm-hmm. right? Which partially had to do with the uh, um, Manhattan School, University of Illinois, and that stuff kind of started in the fifties. But I do think there's a little bit of a sense of two tracks. One is sort of percussionists wanting to have something to play, so they write some music. And the other is, I think, what MR is talking about right now, which is the the sort of, I don't know if you call it the mainstream of contemporary music, because it itself was kind of not a mainstream. But when you're talking about the world of Stockhausen's and, you know, what people commonly thought of as the classical avant-garde, stuff like that, like, at what point does our world as percussionists intersect with that stuff? And that's where it's pretty thin at this period that you're talking about. MR, you wrote an article, I want to say it was 1966, towards like maybe the end of your graduate work, of like a survey of contemporary, yeah. is that what it was, a survey? Of, what was that called, that article, do you remember? I don't remember. We'll find it. it. It would be a good, Josh, this is really, really cool. It was like, was it at the end of your master's degree? Yeah. You did that? It, um, well, it had to be a little bit after. Maybe I wrote it when I was in college. Okay. But uh, it was after. But remember, uh, think about this, the kind of literature that, the older literature that we consider classics, they weren't performed in the 60s. Nobody was playing um, um, third construction. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was being played uh, probably in the 50s, late 40s and 50s by non-percussionists. And then uh, in the 60s, or early 70s, I mean, it probably wasn't played very much. The person to talk to about that, of course, is Jan Williams. And you guys should really... Get, get in touch with him. Mm-hmm. Give you the information about his. Uh, I can give his email and stuff if you want it. Yeah. Um, and for but, folks who don't know, Jan Jan taught uh, University of Buffalo um, was sort of at the tip of the spear with you and amongst and many other folks in terms of the development of a lot of this repertoire. Yeah, and he had a big uh, repertoire organizing and commissioning initiative when he was at Buffalo. He had a percussion quartet in the '60s. I think they were called the New Quartet or something like that. Don't forget um, with. Um, uh, what was the composer's name? Um, Morton Feldman mm-hmm. and Cage. Morton Feldman, Cage, people like this. But um, when was Pli Son Pli? Uh, when was um, uh, all the other pieces written uh, by, um, uh, not Stockhausen, but um, uh, Boulet? Mm-hmm. When was Marteau written? Uh, so... So those are the kinds of things you're, I'm thinking about. Mm-hmm. Right. Done very little, and was it was more. Don't forget also that um, um, Moni Feldman's music was mainly played in in uh, museums. Mm. It was not played on the concert stage. It was played in museums. It wasn't until a little bit after the things became. Uh, don't forget, there's also something in the '60s um, music by. Um, um, Michael Colgrass, he wrote a bunch of pieces. Jack McKenzie wrote a bunch of pieces, but they weren't known. They were just sort of close at the University of Illinois, uh, hardly known at all. Um, I'm trying to think of any other pieces. Uh, I think we could go back maybe and take a look at my paper. <laughs> well, I'm curious, Mike, you, you mentioned to um, the University of Illinois. I think there's an, imp- an important figure there, Tom Sywe. I mean, he, he, uh, on his own has di- there's two volumes of books that he's published that are it's like chamber music percussion chamber music and then solo percussion music right and they're like it's just all the data it's like here's the piece here's the composer here's the instrumentation here's the publisher here's it's like that you know 600 pages or something crazy and um i'm curious if like if that sort of approach from Tom was something that was that it was something that you all picked up, I mean, knowing as a student and, and Adam too, it's like you pick up some of the traits and habits and ticks of your teachers, whether you realize it or not. And because Tom was such a curatorial person, do you did that sort of? I feel like if he wasn't, we we wouldn't know it was nearly as much as we know right now about it because his students wouldn't be uh, 
thinking about this stuff in the way that you do? Well, my answer would be no, because when I started him, he didn't, we didn't discuss that stuff. Although the pieces came and we played them Mm -hmm. by Martirano and um, Brune. Uh, I remember playing the first performance of the uh, Brune's Trio for percussion. Do you know that piece? Nice piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. The phone, uh, you know, percussion, a flute and bass, kind of a little piece. Um, and then he has another trio for trumpet, trombone, and percussion. Mm. Uh, really good pieces, but those were very early pieces, and they were. I mean, where were they, where were they being played? Maybe at um, uh, by Paul Price, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and University of Illinois. But tell me another place they were being played. I, I don't know of any. When did Paul Price? Was it Paul Price or uh, was it Paul Price wrote the, that series of bass drum solos? Are you thinking maybe, maybe he did? But I think you think of Barney Childs. You know that name, Barney Childs. I don't know that name, but I there, I, I think it's Paul Price. But I'll. I'll... I mean, Paul Price had had the Manhattan School um, Percussion Ensemble, and so I think in terms of student ensembles in New York, that was that was where a lot of that activity was happening. Mm-hmm. That's that's the other place that was happening. But he was originally at the University of Illinois, right? Mm-hmm. And then he in the fifties, in the late fifties, fifty nine, I think something like that. He went to. Uh, Manhattan School, and he played uh, some of the early uh, Nicholas Flagello. Uh, <laughs> it's like that. You know that name? <laughs> but take a look at read my uh, my paper. I think I mentioned it in there. Uh, you know, those are the pieces that that are now completely lost. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Takata, uh, Chavez Chavez Takata. I'm not sure of the dates. You'd have to really check to find out the dates. But those are the pieces that were being played, but not by not by um, uh, CIM or New England Conservatory or University of Kentucky, like they're being played now all over the place, or every other college. Um, think about it. Places that we always used to think of as marching band places um, or classical, uh, they they didn't play that that music. Uh, but now it's it's the center, the very center of what we do. So I wanted to ask you then, and, and Josh, I haven't listened to your last podcast with him or so if I if I end up overlapping too much, you can let me know. But you played in the Milwaukee Symphony for um, a number of years before coming to Oberlin. So your primary your primary thrust career wise was as an orchestral player, yeah. early on, which is to say that in your generation that would that was that was your main option as a classical percussionist was to play in orchestras. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when you got to Oberlin, what are the circumstances around you wanting to do the Oberlin percussion group and wanting to have percussion, contemporary music and percussion chamber music in the program? Because as you're saying, the repertoire around it and the whole idea of it was still something that was kind of up in the air. What made you compelled to want to do that? Did you do it from your very first year at Oberlin? I remember playing, as a matter of fact, let me see if I can find it for you. I could conceivably pull up the first program. Oh, that'd be great. Let me see. Um, and this is what year? 72, 73. Uh, Oberlin OPG site. Uh, I'm going to, and then I'll, uh, as soon as I get it, then I'll, um, you know, I'll uh, share with you. Uh, I need to make you a co-host, um, but I can do that real quick. Okay, here. do that for me. Okay, you are... Share screen. You should be able to share now. The attendee screen sharing, okay. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, so here we are. Can you see that? Mm-hmm. So here is the first program. Mm. Gerald Strang, Gregory Kocek, Randy Coleman, who taught at University of Illinois, Kabbalah. So that was December 1972. I mean, I just thought that there was a place for contemporary music uh, in, in the percussion ensemble. I just thought it was an important thing, I, I, you know? And there's a, uh, the second concert. Yeah. Ed Miller, Lou Harrison. Oh, that's right. People were playing Lou Harrison, but not very many. Right. Does these names mean you, ring a bell to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think I've seen some of these posted in the um, storage closet, right? Sure. 
Richard Fitz, he was another person. Louise de Pablo. Richard Hoffman taught at Oberlin. Mm -hmm. And Boulez, with Mrs. Rosen, sang with me. And there's Cage. I was doing Cage pieces in the 70s. I don't think they were doing being done very often. Um, well, we, we kind of think of those Cage pieces as a mainstay of college percussion ensemble because when we were going to school in the late 90s, teachers such as yourself had incorporated them into your curricula. But in the 70s, that it had to kind of be resurrected to some degree, right? Yeah. I, well, I had to go to, I was, you know, I was born in Philadelphia, so I would go back and I would go to the uh, Fleischer Collection. And I remember going to the Fleischer Collection when I was in high school and looking up music and seeing big tables. This is kind of interesting. Big, uh, large tables with guys with visors over there on their heads uh, and lights, handwriting, hand copying uh, manuscripts. Really? And that, that was, you know, there were several ro a room with 10 people in it, maybe. Wow. And every time I went, there was less and less, and then copying became popular. But that was where you found that music. It wasn't published. Right. Did, wow. you, uh, did, did you work, uh, did Cage come through and ever hear your groups or work with them? Oh, yeah. 19, um, let me see. Let me find it. Imaginary Landscapes. Okay, that's the only one. Let me, She's let me asleep. 80s. And maybe in the 80s. Uh, this is also when we used to go on tour. Mm. Uh, he came, I don't remember the exact date. I do have it written down somewhere. But he came with... Um, uh, Merce Cunningham, and we did a concert, and um, you'll know about this, Adam, in the old um, gym. Mm -hmm. You know Warner Gym? Sure. We did a concert there, and we did um, She is Asleep. I played piano. Marlene played, sang, obviously. And then we did um, Wonderful Widow of 18 Springs. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the middle of... Uh, she is asleep because we did the Tom Tom part too. Uh, it started raining. Mm. A, um, skylight, if you remember, in uh, the Warner Gym. Yeah. Very old building uh, with actually a running track around the top. But anyway, it was very uh, interesting and it started raining and it got made a lot of noise. Now, I didn't conduct the Tom Tom part. So I remember looking over a cage and he looked up at the, at the skylight and smiled. He must've loved that. Very pleased with the fact that it was making noise there. <laughs> That's great. Mike, would you, oh yeah. Would you, so one of the things I'm struck here by just looking at this is the, the quantity of rep. Like you, there was a lot, like you just did a lot of rep. I mean, it's really remarkable. To, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not making a quantity over quality argument. I'm just like, it's really impressive to me that just the, like, did any piece get repeated in that? Like, I'm just trying to see, like, I, I think now, and it's like, I've only, you know, I teach at NYU and it's like, there's pieces I'll repeat every couple years for various reasons. But I don't know. I, it, it strikes me that it strikes me that this early on in the, in the sort of university system, that yeah. there was this much rep coming out of one place. Well, I think it was important to do it at, uh, the only reason I would rep repeat something would be something like, um, where is it? Um, the James Tenney pieces. You know those pieces? Wake for Fives, Crystal Cannon for Verez, and Hockett for Henry Cal. You know those pieces? I've never played I, any of them, but I know of them, yeah. I played them when I was at Oberlin. They're wonderful pieces. They have a lot of pedagogical value, too. That's right. That was the way I was thinking of it. Of course, I was thinking of... A, a dual way of doing it. And the one way was <coughs> how do I teach these kids to play together? How do I teach them to um, have a sense of ensemble, sound, listening, um, uh, how, to, how to work rehearsals? Because as you remember, uh, I think you probably remember, Adam, I would come to the first rehearsal and then I would 
wouldn't come for three rehearsals. Right. Remember, I'd say, okay, guys, see you later. Yeah. Do it. And then I'd come back after two or three rehearsals and try to hone your um, uh, ability to work together, right. to adjust to each other, to pick instruments and things like that. And then we'd fix it and then go back again. So um, that was the way I thought about percussion ensemble. And then the idea of um, of um, doing works that uh, were new. So here's a little list of compositions uh, of people whose piece, pieces we did new. James Wood, Lewis N Nielsen, you know him? Mm -hmm. You know Lewis Nielsen, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he was he he came to Oberlin after I left, but I've yeah I've known a bit about his work. And did you know Evan Hawes? I know who that is. I've met him a couple times. Yeah, New York has become a huh? uh, Ross Feller, Paul Cox. Were you at school when Paul Cox was there? Paul is a little older than me, but I got to know Paul really well because he was at the Cleveland Museum of Art when I was an undergrad, and we would go and play there a bit. And mm -hmm. so I got to know Paul pretty well. You were actually just highlighting um, before this the. The premiere of Zanakis Pleiades, the American premiere, was at Oberlin. Um, and this, with there being a lot of professional groups right now, I think it would be interesting for people to realize that because there were very many fewer professional groups at that time, a lot of the big events were happening with student ensembles. So now, I mean, for us, this piece is a landmark um, right now. We've done it a number of times ourselves. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that, and he came and he came for that performance. Yeah, I remember kind of an interesting thing that happened. Um, he came and then he, we had dinner with him. We had him over for dinner. And um, he seemed rather distant during the day. Uh, first of all, should I leave this up or take it away? You guys want to? You can, uh, you can unshare. I think it's okay. I can, I can take a screenshot of it and, and share it later. Well, and we can share it. It's up there on the, on the website, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 So um, he was uh, over for dinner, and we're sitting around. It was, I think Randy Coleman was there, and a couple other composers. And he was he seemed rather bored. And then my son, Josh, who was about nine or ten. Uh, did you notice the date on there? I forgot. I didn't notice it. 81. 81. Okay, so he was born in 71, so he was 10, 9 or 10 years old. And he, for some reason... I have no idea, came into the room uh, where we were having dinner and said, Dad, I'm having trouble with this math. <laughs> so uh, Zanaka said, I can help you with that. And they went off and uh, Zanaka helped my son with math for a while. Was he in a better mood after that? He was in a much better mood after <laughs> he came back. Did, did your son help him understand what it means to write for an instrument that doesn't have the range you want? <laughs> Maybe they could trade some, trade some advice. <laughs> that we didn't mention that. <laughs> Wait, so that was a, kind of a good, a nice memory. That's, oh, that's great. That's great. That uh, incident, but I remember he came to uh, uh, Oberlin. We played the piece. Oh, right before we played the piece, I called up uh, the New York. I think it was Tomasini, if I'm not mistaken, in New York, and said, "Look, we're doing the um, American premiere of a really big piece uh, for." Uh, and Zanakis is coming and he's going to do other pieces. They didn't just do this piece, by the way. The uh, the school did several other pieces, plus this one, um, over a, oh, in the course of a week. And I said, well, you guys should come send a, a reviewer to sue it because it's very important. And he said, nah, if it's any good, it'll come to New York. So if you can imagine, I, I had a couple expletives, if I remember, uh, about him. And that was it. Anyway, it was a good performance. Although the instruments is not what he wanted. He calls for the sister, Sixten, and he was never satisfied with that. Uh, we went to, um, he went to Toronto and played it there. And Bob Becker told me the same thing, that they made something according to what he, what his rules were. I, uh, you know, his instructions on the part. And I did it. And he said, I don't like it. And I said, uh, so, and now they're using all sorts of big things and, huge instruments and things like that. I'm sure, I imagine he'd be pleased, but I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, we, um, I, I made our set of six, and because we first started doing the piece when I was still in grad school, and um, it overlapped with doing it at Yale. And I kind of actually, I knew these stories. I had heard this from you and other people that he basically was never happy. So I 
decided that, um, you know, the melange movement where you have to jump back and forth between the setups, I decided, you know, I wanted to try to make it a smaller instrument so that it was easier to jump between the different setups. As a result, ours are, um, I think you may have even been at our performance at PASIC some years ago. Ours are a little higher pitched. They can be a little, they can be a little abrasive, but it, it works with the sort of fitting in with the other setups. But you know, I followed the rules that he had, but they were, they were pretty vague. I mean, they were really like, oh, you know, make these metal things and don't follow a scale and all of that kind of stuff. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about being abrasive uh, right. because I think that was his stock. That's it. Yeah. So that's no, that's no problem. I remember another incident with Persifasa. Have you guys ever done Persifasa? It would be six people, but we did Persifasa and I heard the percussion group of, um, Strasbourg play it uh, at CIM, and they used lose little handheld um, metronomes. Mm. I've looked at each other and went like that, and uh, I just remember it, 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 this is not right. It's not together. So mm. I made a um, tape. Uh, unfortunately, at the time there was only four channels, right? So two channels were by themselves, single, no problem. But the other two channels had to have two clicks on it. So what I did was made one of the clicks high, one of the clicks low. So I told the player, don't listen to the low click, just listen to the high click. Mm. So what they really heard was, gom dig, dig, gom dig, dom dig, gom dig, dom oh, dig, wow. right? And so it took some, some um, practice for them to sort of um, not listen to the low one, not only listen to the high one. But it probably when I would go over to the tape recorder, and it was a real real tape recorder, and push the tape recorder. But it was only during those sections that called for um, the overlapping of time signatures. Mm -hmm. I didn't use a um, – some places use click tracks all the time. And I never, I never liked that. I never liked the idea of a click track. I mean, string quartets don't use that, so why should we? But the whole idea was, was – um, Percussion ensemble. What do I want from that? I want it to be like a string quartet. I wanted. I conducted very few things. Um, uh, in the beginning, it, it needed it, and it was kind of interesting that uh, in the beginning I would conduct a piece that I thought was a little complex, and then I would say to the guys, "Well, do you want me to conduct?" You know, and then finally I got to where they say, "said said I'm not conducting. You guys go." But of course, I would coach. Right. Look on the website. Um, and then you'll you'll find out the uh, OPG website that has all the concerts. It's I, I like to think of it as a uh, as an archive. It has all. And matter of fact, uh, Adam Slowinski's concerts on there too. Uh oh! <laughs> Did you know that, Adam? I uh, that makes sense. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I would actually love to look through that. Mike, I'm curious as a as a as a from a pedagogical standpoint, um, what, as you were teaching chamber music, did you see any sort of unintended consequences? Like all of a sudden the orchestral section playing got better and like, or did you see anything like, how were the, how did that affect the rest of the way the studio worked or communicated in other ensembles? Well, what I did notice is that I used, and I didn't even tell you this, I used it as a platform for you guys to play together better that was sort of an obvious thing but it was about sounds they would play a symbol and i'd say well does that symbol fit no let's get a different symbol and we you know we would have 10 or 15 symbols right in the room and we try them we try different beaters we try different sounds we try different wood blocks and where do you hit the wood block and remember putting x marks on the wood block so we make sure we hit it in the right place finding the right wood block what's the balance some instruments um uh, most con con composers don't really understand about the notion of uh, balance in percussion instruments. They think that they all sound the same. And when you look at them on a, uh, on a score, they all look the same. Um, when you, sometimes when you play them through MIDI, they all sound the same. <laughs> no, about balance. And that was another thing we dealt with. So those are the kinds of things we dealt with. And um, I got it backwards, to tell you the truth. Uh, because Charlie Owen uh, would say to me those kinds of things it has to be perfect it has to be the right sound it has to be uh, the right instrument it has to be played the right way etc etc all those fine details and then I just brought that into contemporary music and said well 
Of course, you have to do it in contemporary music, too. Uh, that's one of the things that bothered me about early contemporary music played by uh, some um, schools was that there was no thought to that. Um, contemporary players were very um, satisfied if they got there, if there was a complicated thing with uh, several mallet changes. Uh, I would make it more difficult for students. I'd say, no, you got to change the mallet. You can't play a, a big tam-tam with a marimba mallet. You just can't do that. Um, and uh, th now I think students sort of understand that now. But in the beginning, um, these guys, I remember I was working with the University of Illinois, um, Mike Ranta, you know Mike Ranta? You know the name Bill Parsons? Oh, yeah. Fabulous players. Absolutely fabulous players with a concept of contemporary music at the time that I had no idea about. You know, coming from uh, How's Your Snare Drum Roll and Capriccio Espanol Sound. That's, what, that's where I was. And these guys are doing wild things, but their snare drum roll was terrible. <laughs> And their, their sound concept was terrible. And I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be great if you could put those things together? And that's, that was my intent when I played contemporary music and when I coached it with, uh, with students. So uh, I'm, actually one thing this brings up for me that's interesting is, um, so we did a lot of orchestral stuff when I studied with you, and that was a lot of your background professionally and training-wise. And also through OPG, you uh, you know, thinking of like lineage and who passes what on to whom, you also, though, created kind of a place that other things emanated out from in terms of percussion ensembles. So um, Josh and I both studied with Robert Van Syce at Yale. He had been in OPG as a young student. Um, but, um, you know, Al Adi is somebody who he had been at Oberlin before you taught there, but he was your high school. He was your student when he was in high school in Milwaukee, right? Mm -hmm. He was used to drive down from Sheboygan. From Sheboygan. And I, I love this because it's like these people who become kind of constellations in our world, They all it all seems sort of disembodied. Oh, here's uh, Michael Rosen at Oberlin, and here's Al Audi at Cincinnati, and here's Bob Van Syce at Yale, and here's all these people out there. When in the reality, the field itself used to be, probably still is, but it used to be small enough that you would realize that all of these people were actually connected in this really funny and quirky kind of ways. And I remember Al telling me that he, when he was a student at Oberlin and they were thinking about having a new percussion teacher, he actually was one of the people who was pointing them in your direction. He told me that once. Yeah, that's true. He was instrumental in helping me get the job. It was it, it, Eventually, it was between two people, between me and Jack Moore. Okay. You know Jack Moore? I don't think so. He was a timpanist in the um, Minnesota Symphony. I had known him... Um, in Philadelphia, because he studied with Charlie Owen also when he was in the Marine Band. He used to come up and, and uh, study with him. And he was a fabulous timpanist. He was the heir, uh, the heir to Cleveland Orchestra. He studied with Duff, and he was going to be the next um, timpanist in the Cleveland Orchestra. Everybody knew that. I mean, it's just, there wasn't anybody who was near played as well as he did. And he was on tour with the, the Minneapolis Symphony, and he had a brain hemorrhage in the airplane and literally became incapacitated, couldn't talk. It was really a terrible, terrible thing. But this was well well after. And so how would Oberlin have changed, have been different, if a classical timpanist had been there instead of me? I think the reason I, I did get the job was that the uh, people involved, Randy Coleman among them, uh, were interested in the fact that I had been to University of Illinois and worked with Margarano and Page and um, Gaburo and people like that. Um, but you did also have the credentials of having been principal percussionist in the Milwaukee Symphony. Exactly. So I had both uh, both sides, and I think that was one of the things that was appealing. But I told you before, and I think you knew this, I may have mentioned it already to you, Josh, that I came to Oberlin not with thoughts of staying, but with thoughts of, of having a time to audition for the next big job in the Philadelphia Orchestra or Cleveland or something. Um, that was my intention. Uh, but then after a while, I got there and began to realize that I really liked teaching, and that was important, and I liked the idea of being able to pick my own pieces and play the volume I wanted and pick the instrument I wanted to and um, sort of be the boss of, a, of an ensemble. Uh, and that's that was one of the reasons I stayed and one of the reasons I um, got so interested in it. Well, I can 
I, sorry, Josh, I just wanted to say really quickly that, you know, when I was in, uh, in high school and auditioning for conservatories, I have this incredibly vivid memory of like going to most of my auditions. OK, play for us for a while. OK, thank you very much. Next, you know. Um, and I remember so well that in my audition with you, it was it was a lesson. I mean, I didn't even feel like I was in an audition and we played and talked for like 45 minutes. And you were the whole time you were filling me with information and asking me questions. And I remember coming out of that. And my mom was taking me around to these places. She was like, how did it go? And I was like, great. We just we just like hung out and talked and played. And when you were talking about why you ended up enjoying that job, I mean, that engagement, that sense of like, we're really in it in this room together and where ideas are happening and that kind of thing. That was really one of the driving forces for me of wanting to go there is like, well, that appeals to me. That is to me is what that hour should feel like. Every And it was every hour we spent together in lessons had that same amount of energy. I don't think I can ever remember you just sort of like kicking back in your chair being like, okay, play for me. Okay, cool. You know, like, I don't think that ever happened. You always had something to say. You always had a question you wanted to bring up. You always had something you wanted to probe. Um, so I don't know. I guess it ended up, that did end up being a good fit for you. Glad, glad you have that memory. Um, I've always thought that if you're going to, if you're going to fly all the way to Oberlin from California or Texas, or wherever, to audition, that the least I can do is give you a half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, I've never quite understood the panel of people sitting, and then you play for 10 minutes, and thank you very much, goodbye. I want to find out what you are like as a student. Right. I want you to find out what I'm like. I mean, I, if, if you remember, uh, I hope you do that, I would kid around. Oh, Totally little jokes and things like that. I, would, you know, I do that on purpose to see um, how, how do we relate. Um, right. uh, I, I ask you to change something, do something different. Uh, uh, how do you respond to what I say? Are you open to it? Can you do it quickly? Uh, it's not just about your chops. Um, and I want you to know me. I, if a student walks out and says, that guy's nuts. I don't want to study with him. He's, he's just crazy. That's fine. Goodbye. Nice. It's good. And um, I want to find out if you can respond. So it, it's a two-way street. It's a mentoring situation. It's a give and take. It's teaching is not just giving um, and the student just take. It's, um, you know, it's an organic experience. And that's the way I've always thought about it in lessons, especially in um, auditions. I guess maybe just I'm curious about people. I'm kind of a gregarious person, and I like to talk to people, and maybe that's part of it. You know, where are you from? Uh, have you ever eaten in that restaurant in that town? Uh, what, what's, you know, I just sort of, uh, I also think about it as loosening up people because everybody goes in very tense, and I'll have a person play something and start to play it, and then I'll say, no, no, start again. You know, or I'll say, hey, play, hit the drum a little bit just to get to feel what it sounds like. Or I'll have three drums set up. Which one do you want? You know, it's. I've, I'm reminded to, I mean, um, so I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I, I feel like the teacher, like Adam talks about you the way I talk about, you know, Larry. And um, in terms of like just somebody constantly opening doors and being like, hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you seen this? Like not pushing anyone through a door, but just being like, hey, have you seen this? Um, and. And it just that seems to me like that's that's sort of been an ethos. That's been your long term mission statement. Like regardless of where the winds of change are, are blowing, where the fads are going, it's just like you're just constantly opening doors. And I want I want to put a pin in the orchestral side of things for two seconds because I think the other thing right now that's that I'm thinking of in terms of these door opening things are cultural the cultural side of what we do. And you and like for me it was steel drums. But for you, it was Japanese marimba playing was was a very specific door that you went through, and I'm curious, and it and it really rippled throughout the the, the contemporary percussion world. And I'm curious, um, I don't want to get a sidetrack from the orchestra side of things, but I'm curious for you, can you talk about what that experience was like for you, and how and and just you know how people can think about this sort of stuff? Well, it's um, it's just music. I mean, I wanted to play some music on marimba, and there was no music. So I um, looked for pieces to do. I played four mallets at the time. Very few people were playing four mallets. Uh, a few people, but not not new pieces. And that's the way I felt about, about uh, percussion ensemble, too. I wanted to play real pieces. I wanted to play 
uh, pieces that were not. See, it's now it's not so far. Then it was very far. Classical and contemporary music was much farther apart than it is now. Now it's sort of become both. They've sort of come together. Listen to think about how many orchestras uh, in colleges play um, contemporary pieces. Um, think about how many people can slip easily from orchestral to contemporary music, um, to timpani, to steel drums, to marimba. It, it was it was not quite that way. Adam is and, now a steel drum player, by the way. I don't know if you knew this. No. You know that. Well, so the, before the pandemic hit, we all went to Trinidad for Panorama. Yeah. And of course, Josh has been playing for 20 years, but the rest of us, we got we borrowed steel uh, lead pans. We learned the panorama tune, and in one absolutely blistering week, we caught up with the band and learned the tune and played in the panorama finals. So I'm officially a steel drum player now. It was a completely other because you know the instruments laid out in a completely unique way. So you're literally like C, yeah. D, you know. <laughs> well, you have to come back and play with the can consortium. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe Josh, Josh would be a great guest for them. I still have a long way to go, but that was a really amazing experience. Well, for me. and you, and you, but and with and Adam had to do that with a steel drum where the, the instruments weren't laid out. But the marimba is traditionally an African like originated instrument um, from the continent Af- of Africa. But there was Keiko Abe in Japan using that instrument or a modern version of that instrument to put a whole new type of music um, to uh, play to play music, right? Not to play uh, circus music on the marimba. Mm. That was what what is thought of, you know. It was that was the, the thing, and, and there's uh, there. That's kind of nice. I like that, but it, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I never went into African music. I never went into tabla playing. It was just a whole different genre for me. I have all sorts of um, well, kind of personal views about um, uh, people who play sort of tabla and sort of African music and sort of Indian music. Um, it, it just seems to me that it has to be much more commitment. And I wasn't ready to commit to that or to Brazilian music. It was, it was fabulous. It just wasn't my thing. Uh, take a look at Gordon Gottlieb became an absolute ex- expert on um, uh, Brazilian music. Bob Becker, uh, playing tabla and other sorts of instruments and African music too, because they had they worked with some, with uh, Ibrahim and those people. It was just it just was not my thing. I had uh, marimba, uh, contemporary music, and orchestral, and I found that orchestral music was a a way to get into contemporary music, if you can imagine, because that made your chops better, that made you play a better role to play more clearly to. Uh, sight read better, to know about uh, listening, um, to finding your place in the orchestra or in the ensemble. And it transferred. I mean, you can tell me, uh, Adam, how it transferred directly, maybe without even thinking about it. No, I mean, I mean, it did transfer. And I mean, I would actually say that when we studied with Bob at Yale, he carried a very similar ethos into things in the sense that... Um, Yes, we were doing a lot of percussion chamber music, but if one of your sort of skills that would help you be a better orchestral player was kind of uneven, he would, and you did this all the time, you would use an assignment in a in an ensemble piece or in an orchestral piece to sort of work on that thing and to see them as being um, compatible with each other. Snare drum roll is a great example. It's like, can you get through life without a good snare drum roll? I'm sure. Why not just have why not have one? <laughs> because it's gonna do a lot of better things. And if contemporary music includes playing the Bartok sonata, well you've gotta have a good snare drum roll to play that second movement. And so um I remember that you would often use part assignments strategically to help bolster skills that needed to be worked on more in lessons. The great thing about that is that you would be like, oh, great, I've been working on my snare drum roll. Well, now I have to do it in a pressure situation when the conductor points at me. That's a completely different physiological and brain experience than just doing it in the practice room. And when when I was at Oberlin, we had so much performing, so many part assignments, so many ensembles to play in. I mean, we were just dropping, we were just dropping at the end of the day of exhaustion in a great way. 
for all of the all of the performing that we did. And you were always plugging us in with 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 thought towards the skill that we were working on much more slowly in our in our lessons. Yeah, if a student was if the role was getting better, I would put him on a big orchestral part, even though he, uh, he or she might have been a freshman. That didn't matter to me. You were ready for it. Right. Uh, you would play, if you remember, you would play right next to seniors. Right. The important thing was, are you ready for the part? And I would never give you a part that would embarrass you. Right. I would try to give you a part that would push you, make you uh, play a little bit better, and that you could play. Uh, I mentioned that to students when they come in. I say, guys, you're going to play right next to seniors. There's no, there's no uh, seniority at Oberlin. Uh, seniors play the best parts. Freshmen play triangle. That's not the way it goes. Uh, if you've been working on symbols, all right, we'll give you a symbol part. Um, you're not going to get uh, the, the timpani part in Rite of Spring as a freshman, but I don't think you expect it. Uh, so it's a, to me, teaching and playing in ensembles is all developmental. It's all part of that, that getting better kind of experience. Um, I remember a student who was doing pretty darn well in snare drum, but got a lot of nervous. We did uh, uh, Shostakovich 7, and I gave it to him. You know you know about Shostakovich 7, the, the Russian bolero? Yeah. Well, he, he nailed it. First rehearsal, not so good, but he practiced, and he used that as a platform, uh, as a, as a, wood, uh, uh, a, um, a platform to get better. And, and something to aspire to. And sure enough, he did it, and he's never sorry he played the part. So that's the, that's the kind of thing I've always thought about at Oberlin, uh, trying to integrate orchestral playing with contemporary music playing, <clears throat> with um, marimba playing, and even timpani playing. Don't forget, Oberlin is an undergrad school, and I expect students to all play everything. I had a fabulous student for a while who, used, who was in high school. He used to come to me for many, many years. I've forgotten his name, but he was an unbelievable marimba player at the age of 15, 16. Um, and then I accepted him at Oberlin. He went in to come. He said, I only want to do marimba. I said, no, you're not going to do marimba and, Mar and Oberlin, you're going to do everything. Well, he didn't come because I didn't, I told him that's the way it's going to be. So I've never had a student, except for this kid, say to me, oh, I don't want to do timpani oh, I don't want to do um, snare drum because I'm a mallet player. When you go to, uh, when you go to um, grad school, okay, now's the time to concentrate on timpani because you've got the background. Uh, but when, when Bob came to study with you, didn't he only want to do timpani? He only wanted to do timpani. Ah, <laughs> uh, the world has a fickle way of working itself out, right? I mean, it's very strange. <laughs> well, and then he studied, and I... We did snare drum the first semester. <clears throat> Second semester, we did marimba, and I think he got turned on from, by marimba. And then he left, you know, to go to uh, CIM. Mm -hmm. And then for a year or so, he came back and took lessons, marimba lessons, because there was nothing there at CIM. That was an uh, orchestral school, uh, and is to this day, maybe a little bit less, but mainly to this day. I mean, take a look at Curtis. Curtis was... Who was there? Hinger uh, was there, and um, that was it. Um, you didn't, you didn't play marimba. And you, just a side note, you you premiered uh, Tours Three in nineteen seventy uh, seventy three, correct? Yes. And um, I think for a lot of students who you know maybe go to Steve Weiss and get the book of the you know Japanese marimba solos, and there's you know there's a handful of solos in there, time for marimba, you know, conversations, those sorts of things. Um, you were patient zero for that in the United States. Is that fair to say? Well, I had this, this score. I think, did I tell you the story and the other thing about getting the music? No. The could you please retell it? Um, if you did, I don't, rem I, I'm not, I can't quite remember. So please just to be safe, that'd be interesting. We gave me the recording of Keiko Abe. And I went to Tom Saibu when I first got to Oberlin and I said, Tom, what, what is this teaching business about? Help me out. I've never done this before on this level. You know, I taught before, but never on this level. And he gave me some great advice. And then he gave me this record by Keiko Abe, uh, LP, with all these pieces on it. <clears throat> uh, of course, you couldn't get the music. There was no music. It was not published. So there happened to be a Japanese student in Oberlin, I remember, 
uh, who's, I think, a pianist. And I got to be friendly with her. And I said, do you know Akira Miyoshi? And she said, oh, I know the name. She said, I, I never met him. I don't know. I said, can you give me his telephone number? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, ask your parents to look up his telephone number in the telephone book. This is 1972. Uh, and she said, okay. <laughs> so I got his telephone number, and I remember sitting in my studio at the same telephone that I've got there now, or maybe it wasn't the same one, picking it up and dialing it and saying, hello, Mr. Miyoshi, will you send me your music? He said, sure. And then he sent me the, uh, uh, I still have Xeroxes at the time. I guess it wasn't a Xerox. It was something else of uh, the pieces, uh, of all those pieces. So that's how I've got them. And I still have the, the manuscript. You need to post a picture of your phone and just say, like, this this tool changed marimba, tw- marimba <laughs> repertoire for, forever. <laughs> Look, I think it would have changed anybody. Somebody would have discovered that music. Somebody would have started writing the pieces. I think I was just fortunate to be in the place I was, to have the curiosity that I had, to have the musical um, uh, inventiveness, maybe, if you want to call it, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe just was... Um, had I been sort of like Bob Becker, maybe I would have been satisfied playing um, uh, ragtime or, or muscle etudes and things like that. I just wasn't. It just wasn't enough for me because I understood um, uh, but appreciated what Bob does. Don't let get me wrong. I just think it's unbelievably fabulous. It just wasn't for me. It wasn't my, my thing. Um, to try to bring con- uh, classical music to my instrument. That was that was my thought. Oh, Josh, do you mind if I ask? Please. So real quick, one one thing that was always interesting for me, so you you teach at a conservatory, and it's a conservatory where a number of the students, probably a third of your class at any one time, are also double degree students in the college. And so, I mean, when I was there, we had people in a percussion studio who ended up becoming... Scott Forth became a physicist slash biologist. Um, Jonathan Simon is a computer programmer now. Like you, you had people who were, and I was never a double degree student, but I loved taking classes in the college and engaging in different things. So you, you always had people who were very broadly curious, and there, you could, on some level, see that as being in conflict with the focus of a conservatory um, training, which is trying to be as good at this one thing, even though that thing has a lot within it as possible. But when I was there, you seemed to have a very um, sort of flexible and welcoming approach, which continued to recognize like, hey, we have a conservatory standard and you, and for the kids who were just going to do music, you know, you could get us focused and drive as hard as you wanted to, but you left room for double degree people to have a broader outlook on the world. Over the decades, do you feel satisfied about the idea that that many of your students have been able to have that kind of reach into other subjects? Well, sure. I'm, um, I think I am uh, basically a very uh, a curious person, intellectual person, and that's the way I approached everything. And if, I, if a person came to me with, with another kind of interest, that was, that was just fabulous to me. I think that's going to make him a better player, not a, not a worse player. Uh, I find the people at the conservatories who are only playing uh, excerpts all the time uh, rather narrow, and they'll probably play it really fabulously. But I also think that's one of the problems with uh, contemporary percussion playing in orchestras. They've become automatons. They've become fabulous players. I mean, just wonderful players with technique that is uh, extraordinary. Um, But I think what's lacking is sort of that... uh, intellectual curiosity and um, sense of um, balance in your life that um, uh, I try I try to do. I mean, I'm interested in a lot of things. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of uh, uh, reading and doing other things. Learning Cooking, language. right? Pardon? Cooking, right? Cooking and learning languages and things like that. And I find that it's all part of me. And the way I teach, uh, which goes on to you guys. Now, if there's a player who comes to me and is really um, uh, playing fabulously and is practicing all the time, great. And then they find the student that all of a sudden the lessons are not going so well. 
for two weeks or so in a row or three weeks in a row. And, you know, well, hey, what's the matter? What's going on here? Uh, well, you know, uh, I, I've been composing a lot lately. And I say, great, go compose. Help yourself. Do, do what you want to do. Um, what the world does not need is another percussionist who doesn't want to do it. You know what I mean? You need people, you want people who want to do it. And every once in a while, I get these people who are dying to do only contemporary music, dying only to do orchestral music, dying only to do timpani. First two or three years, I make sure they do everything else. And then the last year, we specialize. So I remember a, a, a student I had who is now teaching electronic music in Germany, um, who, uh, you know, you could tell he wasn't into it. And I sort of guided him into the, the Tamara program, electronic music. And now he's become a champ of that. I mean, he's uh, teaching there. And that's a lot of people um, I, I put into that or composing or or doing anything or, or becoming a physicist uh, like Scott. I mean, what was I going to say? Don't go to class. Don't <laughs> go to this class. You're going to be a percussionist. No. Well, and Scott was an extremely talented player, so you could imagine a different teacher trying to pressure him to yeah. trying to be one of the superstars that would make the teacher's name bigger. And that just you never you never prioritize those things in that kind of way. Well, I think I think it, it feels to me too like you you have a you have a creative way of solving students' problems. And for some students, it might be you need to pinch your left hand a little bit here on this knuckle. For some students, it might mean, I remember Adam telling me like, yeah, he really helped me on Kiji when he said, you need to, you need to hear what you need to play this like is that you're playing it with four Fs, but just from 400 yards away. <laughs> like, like, like for some people that just reroutes their whole thinking is like bypasses the log jam. Um, it's like it's like teaching like as if you're you're like that Waze driving app that sort of is like <laughs> sort of suggesting all these new routes to save you time. Like Larry Snyder did that with me. Bob did that with me. Did it yeah. with Adam too. Like, um, and I and it reminds me of this creative problem solving. I got the same sense from people like Alan Abel. Like the way you teach a crash symbol to hit the ground is is a same sort of problem solving solution to the way Adam, Alan Abel would like. I need to get my castanets louder, so I'm going to line up eight of them. Like, like I remember sitting in a master class and seeing that and being like, he didn't say anything to me, and I had just had my mind blown. I didn't even hear what he was about, what he did, and I already <laughs> knew what the answer was. Like, how in the hell do you do that? And people can do that, I think, in basketball. People can do that in gardening, and some people can do it in politics, and some people can do it with cassinets and teach. And I feel like you, you are in that club of the, these tinkers. And I'm, I'm curious if you're willing to talk a little bit about the that as as it sort of intersects well, with the orchestral world. Well, what, what I've noticed is that it's about the student. It's not about me. It's uh, sort of like, uh, and I've used this analogy before. I may have said it to you before. But it's sort of like teaching my dog uh, to do tricks. Um, I, I want him to roll over. Why in the world does a dog want to roll over? It's the most un-dog uh, thing to do in the world. Now, what do I have to say or what do I have to do for him to get it? Now, it's, project that to teaching. I say, um, um, hold your hand this way. That doesn't work. Uh, okay, uh, I have to say it in different words. And you guys are teachers too, so you know this. Not every student responds in the same exact way. And you have to make sure that you keep digging to find other ways to do things. That's one aspect. The other aspect is when a student is ready, they get it. You know, you can tell a student the same thing over and over, and then finally they say, uh, oh, why didn't you say this before? <laughs> Not true. <laughs> the students I, um, and Adam will laugh at this because he knows what I'm saying. Um, taught a student the whole the whole semester. Okay, then he comes back after the summer. And he comes back and he says, Mr. Rosen, I got it. I said, really? What happened? He said, this summer, I really got it. I realized that if you throw the stick, it works better. What have I been telling him for the whole year? <laughs> but he got it when he got it. And that's what happens. Um, sometimes you just have to say it over and over again. And if it doesn't work, you say it in a different way. 
Uh, well, I gotta, I gotta say the, the a story for me that illustrates what you're talking about right now. My 15 year old stepson, um, who for most of his life has had extremely uh, limited what he could eat. Um, there was a very, very small, like plain rice and this and that, and that that has been going on for many years. And so my wife and I have gotten in the habit of we cook for him in this very specific way. He came down last night. He was like. Why don't you guys? Um, why don't you guys give me more variety in what I eat? I'm sick of this same old stuff. Like he was kind of looking at us like um, like we had been trapping him in these foods. When of course for years we've been trying to feed him all these different things, and he's like, ugh, ugh, you know, I hate it, whatever. Just out of the blue last night, he's like, why don't you feed me different kinds of food? And I was so like trying yeah. to figure out should I explain to him or should it's, I just? Uh, and, and eventually, what we ended up doing is being like. Okay, great. Let's go for it. Let's let's try some different stuff. But a, he wasn't really for it until that moment. One of the things Paul Paul Lansky used to tell us too is that he's like one of the things he's learned. He used to be the department chair of of, uh, of Princeton for a long time uh, for a while, but he was he taught there for a long time. He's like, you know, the one thing I learned is like if you can if you can go into meetings and by the end of it, every, your idea, everybody else says out loud as if it's their idea, but it was originally <laughs> yours. Like that's the goal, but it's really hard. It's really frustrating. Like it's very you know. My most a- agonizing days as a teacher or weeks or months are when I'm not able to figure out the problem and I keep blaming myself. And I think that's a good place to go back to. But you're totally right also that even after a month, the students, Adam will come in and say something in a coaching and the student's like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting um uh, uh, it's a very interesting contrast of, of ego as a teacher and letting go of your ego mm-hmm. as a teacher. I mean, you have what you want to do. You teach in a specific way. If a student comes in and says, I don't want you to, uh, why do you teach me that way? Teach me a different way. Or um, I had a student one time who said, uh, you know, uh, Vic Firth does it this way. And I said something like, uh, well, you have to go study with Vic Firth. I'm, and I have a cute little expression, which is, uh, if you don't want my apples, don't shake my tree. I love it. So it's the sort of same idea yeah. of I only have what I've got, and there's my ego. But then i got to let go of the ego to make sure that the student uh, absorbs it. And how do I get across to him? Not in one way, not in just my, my – if you don't get it, the problem is you, kid. No, that's not the way it is. It's got to be uh, a two-way street. Uh, I often mention – to a student who comes in in the beginning, that it's a contract. We sign a contract with each other. Uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to mentor you, I'm going to give you uh, everything I've got. I'm not going to hold back anything. And you're going to work for me and for yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's the contract we sign um, uh, in the air. Well, so I think it's just, a, it's a good way to be a human too. I think this idea of, of any, any relationship we have being one-sided, no matter what it is, is just not a healthy way. And no matter where you, like if I'm 90 years old and teaching, it's not a healthy way for me to, to not hear back and forth from a student and, and trust that process over the, over the long haul. Um, I'm curious, I, I, I want to sort of put a, a, we're coming around the home stretch here and I, I want to uh, pick your brain a little bit about the orchestral world. You, you, you have a lot of experience and you were sort of uh, in the area, in the air in, in Philadelphia in particular with that orchestra and those players. I'm wondering, and Adam, if you have any specific questions about this, world, well, please I- chime in. This is something I wanted to ask about, too, because you've told me a little bit about it here and there. Sometimes these ideas that being in a particular place at a particular time is part of your direction in life. And I was thinking about, you know, Alan Abel died very recently. Um, Richard Wiener died a couple of years ago. But these were all people that were in your orbit. I and mean, you grew up on the same street as Richard Wiener. You guys knew each other growing up? or Blocks away. Right. And we used to uh, play gigs together. And I remember sitting outside my house when he dropped me off. He had the car. I didn't have a car. And uh, sort of talking to each other about, what do you think is going to happen in the future? What are we going to do? Right. And I was just joking with him about being older than me. He was just a year older than I. Okay. So, um, I, but then you would, but you would go and hear the Philadelphia Orchestra, right, when you were a kid? But it's organic, uh, Adam. You don't. I, I must admit, I didn't think of it and say, boy, I'm in the middle of really greatness here. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's retrospectively uh, thought. Um, 
it, it, that was just the way it was. That was the way it was played. That was the way the sound was. That was the symbols that Charlie got. I remember going to the concerts on Friday afternoon and taking my lesson in the green room downstairs in, in um, uh, the Academy of Music uh, after the two o'clock concert ended around four. My lesson was four, four thirty. And I'd go downstairs and play the same cymbals. I remember running on stage after hearing Check Four, running on stage backstage because the guys knew me backstage, and going on stage before the audience had left. Still <laughs> going, and I'd pick up those same cymbals he just played, and I played them to try to get that same sound. You know, I didn't think, oh boy, this is the best, this is a better sound than they get in, in uh, New York. I, who? Who knew? You just were there, a part of it. And so Charlie Owen was your teacher when you were in high school age or? University of Illinois. I mean, uh, in Temple University. In Temple. From 60 to 64. And he just happened to be the teacher there. I mean, I was, see, I was a jazz musician before, jazz vibes. And I began to realize that I didn't, I, I wasn't imaginative enough and didn't have a good enough ear to play jazz vibes. So I got very interested in orchestral playing and just because of Charlie, uh, because he was such a wonderful player, an uh, inspirational person when I think about him now. He was not a person who inspired students uh, greatly. For example, I remember sending a student out to Aspen when he was teaching out there. And uh, perhaps the student was too young because he came back and he, I said, how was studying with Charlie Oni? He says, I don't know, I played with him in the orchestra, but he never said anything. He never, he never told me what to do. Uh, I don't know. It was kind of boring. He didn't, you know, and I thought to myself, you were not ready. And that's the other thing. You have to be ready as a student to absorb what the teacher has to offer. And that's what's going to happen um, maybe after a year, maybe after two years, uh, maybe slowly without, rec without a student realizing it. And that's, that's part of teaching. But I'm just as proud of the students of mine who have not become percussionists, who have become lawyers, uh, scientists, um, financial advisors. Um, what else? Uh, oh, one of my students teaches uh, poetry at University of Minnesota. Chris. Chris did you remember, remember Chris? Santiago? He was there with me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it, to me, it was not about percussion. Percussion was the vehicle for those who wanted to do it. Uh, creative thinking, creative uh, thought process um, was the, was the goal, uh, and oh by the way, here's how to play a snare drum roll. So my point is that even if a person was in the college and was taking secondary lessons, I would give them the same advice, the same um, kind of a lesson that I would give to uh, Adam or a student who I knew was going to become a percussionist. It just didn't matter to me because this, that's all I had. I didn't hold back anything. Um, and maybe that's why the students noticed that after a while. Josh, do you remember uh, Brian Chase? Do you remember us uh, yeah. interacting with him a bit? So he was a jazz major at Oberlin. He must have taken secondary lessons with you, Mr. Do you remember him at all? Name sounds familiar. So he ended up playing drums for this very, very famous um, uh, rock and roll band, but he also does experimental music in Brooklyn, and we had practice rooms right next to each other when I was in college, and we ran into each other, did a few things recently, but there are all these different, you know, sort of uh, connections that people make. And I had a student who, who was a, who I was walking in the hall one time, and I heard somebody playing fabulous rock drum set. I opened up the door, and it was Peter Pollock. You know Peter Pollock, that name? I don't know. Mm -mm. He was a fantastic. I never heard him play before. And all of a sudden I heard him play. And now he's playing or he did for many years, played with Blue Man Group. Uh, OK. Not uh, he didn't get dressed up, but he played on this right. the, the back band, right. the, the back, the band behind. And he had a very good career doing that. Um, that. That's the nature of our business now. It's not when I came to Oberlin, there was three or four students. Uh, five at the most, and they had contemporary music week. It was called New Directions. Mm. There was uh, once a week they would have concerts, lots of concerts, interesting stuff. But that was it for the rest of the time. No, no, no contemporary music. Well, things have changed at Oberlin and other schools too. It's, 
it's fascinating to hear you talk about this. And I, I mean, just as you're talking, I'm having feelings of like sort of gratefulness that of, of weird things. Like I'm grateful that our instrument is a big, obvious thing that you can just see and you can basically see how the sound is being made, like just on a big picture level. Like you come to an orchestra concert and as a student, you can see those big crash cymbals and it's not a mystery completely as to how that sound is made. And so you, by nature, feel like, oh, I could, you know, your inquisitive nature takes you there. But you also have players like Alan Abel, like Mickey Bookspan, who will come to the University of Akron. And for me, it will just literally show you every trick. We'll be like, well, here's how I did this. And no, this is the felt right here. Like, see, it's, it's, it's 40 years old. I haven't, no, I didn't buy a new one. I just made this one and it has duct tape on it, you know. And I'm really grateful for that. I mean, there's, the approach could have been different. And Adam and I may not be here or our field would be completely different and it's weird i mean i you're right that in the initial genesis of a lot of this no one's aware that they're in those that that moment of greatness but like those decisions were really important and it's not a conscious thing and it's crazy to see how it sort of butterflied out from there the other thing that i think about is that probably my favorite instrument is the cello i i play marimba uh but i want to play like a cello I don't want it to sound like a bunch of pieces of wood laying on a table. I want to somehow aspire to that. I want to aspire to a text of, of, a, of a singer, Ms. Rosen, who is so lucky, uh, a singer, to have a text. Uh, that's, that's my aspiration. And I've gone, um, I, I've often said, you know, uh, hear a cello thing. I, I want to do that. And I've tried to make that happen in what I do in percussion. Sometimes it's impossible, but sometimes the aspiration is the goal uh, as, as much as we can. And it does not go unnoticed. When we're with groups like you guys who are not just um, um, banging away, but thinking about what you do and trying to uh, integrate a musicality into what you play, and aware of the instruments, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yeah. I want to do warmth in my playing, uh, as well as the upper register of the xylophone. So that's that was the, that's my, been my guiding um, principle, I would say. If there was one one thing, I still remember Adam's great arrangement that I still use of the barber, right? Yeah. Play it anymore? <sighs> Oh, no, I mean, I haven't thought about it in years, but I think uh, I have made that arrangement, and then I think it sort of ended up in your file system and some students, because uh, you always, you have a big, I'm sure you still have them, all the drawers full of music, and you would let students come into your office and just go through them, and that, I have to say, was a wonderful way to find repertoire. We used to just go through your files and look at something and be like, that looks interesting, put it up, try it, you know, um, and so I think it ended up in circulation, because when I talked with your studio a few weeks ago, you mentioned that, and a lot of the students knew about it, and I was surprised, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, I think I had finale, you know, 0.1, um, where I just kind of managed to sort of eke it out, um, and uh, that's cool. I, you know, um, one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about the cello, you know, so uh, Josh and I, and also percussion, we teach chamber music at Princeton, right? We don't we don't actually teach percussion lessons. The, the, the weird irony about the, the career, the direction my career has taken is that the academic job that I have, I don't teach percussion lessons. That's the, like the one thing I don't do. But we, we coach a lot of chamber music. And the the, the mindset of uh, play comfortable and then work your way down into dynamics, you did that with me. I Strangely, I remember this with triangle. I tell people about this. You talked about how if you're too timid, you're going to miss and you're not going to make a good sound. And so you start with you start with comfort. And then you gradually work your way down so that that same energy is in the dynamics. I use that with string quartet because when they're playing quiet, when students are playing quiet, they start to get tentative. Their tuning gets a little funky. And even though I don't have the knowledge to tell them exactly what to do with how to play their instruments, I do know that if we go back to forte or mezzo forte and they're playing with vibrato and all the stuff they're used to doing, and we try to keep that energy and start just ratcheting it down, it works every single time. Well, that's, a skill that I got in a percussion lesson. But the reason it's useful is that it's a it's a greater concept about how your brain works while it's playing music. It's not about the instrument really at all. I mean, I think it's, uh, I tell students that uh, there's uh, there's no difference between piano and forte. One is just softer. Right. 
Yep. I'd said that right, Josh. <laughs> yeah, that well, that's what that was in relation to the Kiji quote that 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 has stuck. I mean, I've used it in steel band rehearsals. I've used it in in string quartet. I used it in a harp duo coaching a couple years ago. Like, you know, I'm going to start using if if you don't want my apples, don't shake my tree more often. That, but um, that does sound like a very Josh. Cohen it's such a. I feel like I feel like, yeah. Um, but uh, well, uh, Mike Rosen, I I, I want to sort of put a put a button on this and um, just uh, see if you have any final thoughts here. I, I, I really, really thank you for your time. Uh, we, Adam and I could talk with you for hours and hours and hours about all this stuff and it's fascinating, but I feel like you've helped uh, younger students here sort of get more of a bigger picture context of, you know, messy or not a bigger picture context of where it is. We, in terms of this tr- limb of the, the music history tree, um, came from. And, uh, I really am grateful for your, for your time here. And I'm curious if you just have any final sort of thought, um, or information for folks who maybe just want to know a little bit more about Oberlin or about anything we spoke more about today. And then Adam, I'll also let you, if you have any final thoughts as well. Well, the, I think the most important thing is to go to, um, uh, our website, you know, the OPG website, let me give it to you right now. Uh, if you're interested in any of those other kinds of things, uh, about repertoire, it's um, uh, oberlin.edu slash percussion. Let me make sure if that's true. I've got it written down here. Um, I'll post it as well. Oberlin.edu OC dash percussion. Okay. Anyway, uh, I should send it to you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and you get an idea of the kind of stuff we've done. There's FAQs on there about questions about what my students are doing and uh, what the audition is like. And it's just sort of the general idea, the kind of the same things that you said uh, about that. Um, but I don't think there's any more, any other thing. Let me just send you this thing. That's the website. There it goes. Okay. I will post that as well. Um, Adam, anything final before we wrap up? Um, well, no, I would, I would say thank you as well. I think one thing that's been really interesting for me about this conversation is I think a lot of things that I've internalized over the last 20 years as just part of the way I look at the world. It's really great to hear. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's awesome for me to hear you calling him Mike, which I will never be able to do. From oh, sorry. Way. Well, that's what he told me in the oh, other no, podcast. Think, I've, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, I think you're fine, but anybody was his student wouldn't, any of us, and MR has always been the sign, sort of easy way for us to do it. But I, I don't I'll, think overdub, I I'll overdub my voice later. Every time I say Mike, I'll put in I think Professor you're Michael I think Rosen. <laughs> anybody who was a student at 18, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a different thing. But just to say that I think a lot of what I've, I've absorbed and internalized, that's just part of the way I look at the world, hearing um, MR talk about it, makes me re-aware, newly aware. Oh, uh, I think there's a reason that some of those uh, attitudes are, are, are my default attitudes of the way I think about things. I was, I was taught those things, but but it's far enough back in the past now that how are these things? You, you can't you can't uh, disentangle them. You can't say, oh, I did, I was here, and now then I learned that. It like it just becomes part of who you are. So I'm grateful for this podcast, but I'm grateful for that as well. And it was really special for me to hear all this stuff. Anything I've said, take it. It's yours. <laughs> Have a nice life. <laughs> Don't shake my tree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Professor Michael Rosen, I am very grateful for your time. I'm also very grateful for your picture of your pizza oven uh, okay. and for your, res- your your tips on my focaccia recipe. And on that, um, I, will, I, will, uh, I will bid you adieu. Thank you so much. Be safe, be healthy, and we will hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid Drum, liquiddrum.com, run by Todd Meehan down in Waco, Texas. Check him out. You won't regret it. You might learn something too, but you're definitely going to laugh. Liquiddrum.com, L-I-Q-U-I-D-R-U-M.com. And also, Kyle Dunleavy makes amazing steel steel drums, uh, the ones that I play and sew, teach on at NYU and Princeton. Uh, and I'm grateful to have known Kyle for almost 15 years now. So, dunleavypans.com. Check him out. You won't regret it. All right. Talk to you soon, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care.